today. Uh, I'm excited for, gosh, lots of reasons. Today's topic and guest um, are just really cool, really inspirational, uh, a lot of fun. I love art. Both my daughters are, are really, really good artists. Uh, and I always, I've always had an appreciation for art. So when I saw the artwork of today's guest, I was like, I have so seen that. And if you're in the sports world and in some of that, you'll probably recognize that. But he's so much more than just the, uh, a sports artist. But he's m so much more than an artist. He's, he's a man that has an incredible story and an incredible testimony. And I'm excited. It's, it's one of those that you go, man, that should be a movie. And now it is. So I'm going to show you the trailer for a movie that is is out now, and you'll you'll be able to find out how you can watch it. Uh, and then we're going to come back and we're going to talk to Steve Skipper, world-renowned artist, and uh, and so much more. So watch this trailer, and we will be right back with Steve Skipper. Steve Skipper. Steve Skipper. Steve Skipper. Steve Skipper. Steve Skipper. Steve Skipper man. I didn't know who he was, but he got my attention. During the time of my childhood, the civil rights movement was going on. The teacher would ask you, what do you want to be when you grow up? You never said artist. She would tell you, think of something else. No black man can make a living as an artist. In 1968, I was a part of the kids transferring into white schools, which was traumatic. The last thing God cares about is you, and that makes you real angry. And it made me a prime candidate for the Crips. I took a job at a cast iron pipe company. When that pipe hit my thumb, I heard the devil tell me, I've got you this time. You'll never paint again. You have the nerve to come in here, the race you are, without a college education, and think that you can actually compete with guys who are here in the right color. He's gifted from God. I've never seen anybody paint like that, untrained, ever. All the peoples of the world will have to discover a way to live together in peace. He gets the spirituality of the movement. It's about content of character. It has nothing to do with color of skin. I believe that what self-centered men have torn down, men other-centered can build up. I still believe. That is Colors of Character, uh, and my guest today is the subject of that film, Steve Skipper. Steve, how are you doing? It's such a thrill to have you. Very, very, very honored to be with you today. I, you know, gosh, where do we even start? I mean, we could talk the whole half hour about the art, and I would enjoy that. But I, I, I guess we, we really need to go into um, the things that you faced growing up. And uh, it's interesting that an artist who deals in colors had to fight color uh, in order to become who God created you to be. Um, give us a little bit of an idea of of how difficult it was for you growing up in a racist time period and, and place? Well, I grew up in a place called Rosedale. It's in Homewood, Alabama, very, very small. And um, there was a lot of dysfunction in my home. And I think that's where the enemy set me up when it came to the dysfunction. And a lot of homes, dysfunction is there. And it has an effect on the children. And a lot of parents don't realize the kind of effect it has on them. Hmm. I think about age 13, I was jumped into a gang called the Crips. And um, that was one of the worst things that ever happened because it's so deceptive. I mean, they offer themselves as family. And when you have that void in your heart, the enemy will bring something to you before the Lord will. He'll bring something to you that looks like, tastes and smells like the very thing that you're looking for. And once I fell into that, that hole, it was like a total um, train ride uh, of hellish behavior and hellish action and everything. But, but I tell you what, there's nothing like 
God loving you enough to come get you. Hmm. How did it get you out? Brother, I was on a, a Saturday morning. I was sitting in a park with 12 other Crips. We're all packing. We all armed. We're sitting out in that park celebrating a robbery we just did Friday night. And there's a there's a swimming pool up on the left side. And the lifeguard at the swimming pool was a guy that was named Big Mike. And he shouted out there, there's 13 people on this table now. He shouted out there, Steve Skipper, you need to give your life to Jesus Christ. At that point, everybody looked up and see if anything else like that happened, they're looking to kill the guy that's, that's disturbing our peace. So, and, and then he comes out from around the fence of the pool and comes down towards where we were. This is extremely a no-no. And I know they're getting ready to kill him. But on the inside of my heart, you know, Jesus said, come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest for your soul. In my soul, I was tired of this stuff, man. I couldn't show them, but I was totally tired. And everything Mike started to say about Jesus Christ, I wanted, but I couldn't show them. Because at this point, I'm leading it. I'm leading in the game. And so uh, I make a deal with Mike. I tell him, I'll go to church with you one night if you start talking to me about Jesus Christ. And he said, deal. He said it too quick. It scared me, you know, <laughs> like he has some plan. He said, I, I know a guy that's an evangelist, and he'll come to this neighborhood right here, and he'll preach just for you. I didn't know what to do with that. But at the same time, I've been to church before in my life, and I know how church works. So I thought, shoot, they get in there and you know, start singing and stuff like that, get all excited for about 15 minutes. I'm sitting on the back pew. When they're praising God and everything, I'm going to slip out of that back door. And I made a deal with a guy to meet me outside the church because that night I was going to start taking speed that night. So I looked at my watch at 7 o'clock. The preacher got up and started preaching at 7.10. The 15 minutes that I thought I was going to stay in there turned into 46 years. <laughs> <laughs> oh man okay so tell me because uh, there's so, so many things going on here at the same time um where did let's go to the art where where is the art uh, throughout your childhood and, and into adulthood well in fourth grade my, my i had an elementary teacher that you know teachers have a gift where they can look inside a student and see what the student can see and so I was one day in the class, I had a notebook and I was drawing on the back of the notebook. And so she looked at the drawing and she picked it up. And she said, oh my God. When she said that, I thought I was in trouble because somebody's calling for God in, your, in the fourth grade, you know you're in trouble. So she took it and ran out of the door. And everybody in the class was looking at me like, you know, what did she do? And I, I just sat there and I was sweating. She came back and got me and told me to come to the office, to the principal's office. I was really sweating at this point. And so, man, we got down to the principal's office and she told the principal, this young man has an extraordinary talent and we need to allocate some funds for some art supplies for him. The principal told her there were no funds. So you know how teachers, you know what their salaries look like even today. She started taking her money to buy me art supplies. I knew nothing about painting. The only thing I knew about was drawing. But she left me, she got a room, and she left me in that room and told me to paint. And I started looking at those brushes, man, and, and uh, you know, the only thing I knew was a pencil, number two pencil. And I think that in the movie, my son, my, my, my youngest son plays me as a fourth grader. Uh, it was Miss, Miss uh, Bernal Saunders who was my teacher giving me, giving me the paintbrushes and canvas. And so once I got to 13, that's when I got in the crypt. And you kind of bury your talent under what you're doing because that's a, that's a dark world that you live in. You know, and Jesus said, men love darkness rather than light because darkness covers up their evil deeds. And so the only thing that mattered in the crypt, I was totally focused on what they were doing. 
and not to be focused could get you in trouble with the big people. So once I got saved and I found out that talent came from Jesus Christ, I fell in love with Jesus Christ on the spot. When that preacher preached the gospel to me, he preached the gospel in a way that was tailor-made for me. It was like everybody in the church disappeared and he was just talking to me. And so, man, uh, I took my colors. We used to tie your uh, crypt colors on your arm, on your wrist. I took them off and threw them on the floor. I was actually crying and never cried. And so God just took that stony heart out and gave me a heart of flesh. Next thing I know, I was on the altar giving my life to Jesus Christ. December 23rd, 19, 1976 at 9.45 p.m. <laughs> oh, man. Okay. So uh, I want to show people the uh, website here for the movie Colors of Character. You can find out how to watch the movie there. It's color, Colors of Character movie.com uh, and you can check that out here is steve's website steve skipper studio.com and you can look man you, you can look at the artwork um i'm, I'm going to show a, a couple pieces let's see let's which one should i go with um here's one called the genius at work uh and and i is that martin luther king jr in the clowns Yes, sir. He went to Bimini, Bahamas, 1964, to write his Nobel Peace Prize acceptance speech. He, he wrote it inside the mangroves of mm. the Bahamas. Mm. So, obviously, the civil rights movement was uh, huge in in your life uh, because you what well, you were you were bust. Uh, you were told you couldn't be an artist. You told you couldn't go to school, all because of the color of your skin. Um, how did you navigate that? Because that's, that's a tough one. Well, I had an uncle that went through much more than I did, mm -hmm. um, in the South, the South was very, very vicious. And so my uncle was a great artist. He used to, he used to draw and paint and I always wondered because I uh, wondered why he didn't go into it professionally. And uh, uh, for some strange reason at the time, he moved to California. Then he would come back home in the summers and something like that to visit. And we'd be sitting in a room, all the family together, and he could pick up a pencil and a piece of paper and draw everybody in the room accurately. And then he would look, get this sad face, uh, you know, he would drop his head and be real sad after that. I never knew why. My mom told me that he faced so much resistance to be a fine artist that racist people had just beat him down emotionally to the point to where he became an alcoholic. And that's how he died. That's how he died. So when my teacher came down there to tell my mom that I was going to be a great artist, my mom didn't receive that well because she didn't want it, the same thing to happen to me. But what she didn't know God had placed something on the inside of me that could take anything that they said and and and, and not fight back. You know, I uh, could have, I mean, could have fought back very validly because I'm a crook, you know. <laughs> That's what we're trained to do. But I don't know how God restrained me and had me to the point of where I took a lot of stuff, man. Looking back, you know, looking back, I, I took a lot of stuff. But uh, for people to say what they said and It'll be a cold day in hell before this guy's artwork is in here and stuff like that. And they didn't even say it that night. So I don't know. Uh, I, but I, I think I think God gave me something when they when they would say I could never do something. He gave me something that would prove them wrong. <laughs> yeah, and prove prove everyone wrong. You have. Uh, I'm going to show another one. This is a friend of the ministry here, Mr. Jason Witten, uh, uh, painting you uh, call True Grit, and that's a classic i mean you know everybody in dallas is going oh yeah i remember that day with this right. helmet come off uh and you've really done so much in the, the sports world uh there's kenny stabler there uh, an undeniable uh there's your bart star which is just a, i mean just a beautiful beautiful painting um here's one unforgettable 
uh, college. You got you got your paintings in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. You got your paintings in the College Football Hall of Fame. Uh, LBJ Presidential Library. I mean, everybody that said you can, you can't is obviously they're wrong <laughs> because you have uh, through all of that. How are you? How did you not become bitter and and hate? If not all white people, at least the white people who use prejudice and racism and, and hatred and, and oppression and all that garbage to try to keep you down. How did you not become bitter? Well, you got to understand something. I had great, great pastors. I mean, absolutely great pastors that would teach and nurture you to go the way Jesus would go. And I think that was the best thing that ever happened to me was the pastors I had around me. And uh, I had some people, a lot of people pray for me because uh, my brother used to tell me, uh, I don't know how you do this. You know, I don't know how you got scared because we started doing artwork at the University of Alabama. We faced a lot of racism, you know, but the, the racism at NASCAR was a million times. <laughs> really? Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, it was a million times what Alabama was. And, but and, God, was just, he, he was strengthening me. And I just, I, I, it was something on the inside of me that wouldn't quit. You know, when, now, when was that? Was that recent? Oh, that, no. NASCAR was at least hmm, right at 20 years ago. And have you, I've been doing it for 40 years. Well, and so that's my question. Have you seen, has it changed? Well, it's changed a lot lately. But then, you know, you have to, you have to consider racism is, it only rears its ugly head when you're talking about going in a door that they don't want you in. Hmm. If you're going in doors like a janitor or something like that, I'm not saying anything about that. Hmm. But if you're talking about you want to go into the fine art business, as an owner hmm. and you create your own product and you decide the price there's some people that got problems with that are you still facing some of that today oh yeah we face it sometimes sometimes here in alabama there, there are places that won't care how I work. and strictly because of your race i mean you know it's it's i don't know why anybody wouldn't carry your artwork because it's that good but how do we knock those things down because that Excuse me, that I can't say it on the air. That ticks me off. <laughs> how, do, how do we how do we knock that down? How do we get rid of that? Well, racism is nothing new to God. Now. You know, God's been saying racism ever since man been down there, and so He knows what to do. And the thing about it is, you know, you hear a whole lot of rhetoric and stuff like that, and people protesting and saying a whole lot of mean and evil things and stuff like that. But the the United States has a resume that when things go crazy in this country. We have a history that sooner or later, the good people are going to stand up. The redeemer of the Lord are going to say so. God can cause things to happen where unsaved people will be forced to come to us for the answer. Like the handwriting on the wall with Daniel. Yeah. We just have to chill out and say what God tells you to say when he tells you to say it. But don't allow the enemy to silence the lambs. Yeah. Boy, that's that is so true. Uh, I, I just I've lost patience uh, in that area, uh, and, and I know a lot of people have. And, and I want to react. <laughs> Thank you for showing us the proper way to react because um, mm, I, I just I don't have any tolerance for that anymore. I, I have a question about uh, a piece you recently did called "Intercession in Washington," and I'm showing oh, that yeah. right now. Oh, uh, yeah. Is is that that looks like Trump's hair in the middle of that prayer circle? Yes, sir. Uh, the Alabama players won the national championship. And God spoke to the punter. He said, I want you to pray for the president. <laughs> he said, I don't want you to pray for a Democrat or a Republican. I want you to pray for that individual man because he has weights on his shoulders that nobody else does. Mm -hmm. This is J.K. Scott that he's talking to. It's, it's, it's over 100 players on the Alabama football team, right? Mm hmm the president speaks and he gets ready to leave. He starts walking across the, the garden back there. And J.K. stops him at the obedience of Christ. This ain't, this ain't planned or nothing like that. The coaches, nobody, the administrators, they don't know anything about this. 
he stops him and he said, can I pray for you, Mr. President? And, and the president turned around and said, yes. And so J.K. grabbed hands with him and bowed his head. He bowed his head. Next thing you know, all these other players start coming in there in the circle. And this is all impromptu. Hmm. You know, the Bible tells us, us, God's people, pray for the leaders. But what the enemy has called us to do is to complain about the leader. <laughs> and if the leader has a problem, which the president has some problems, just like everybody else, if he has a problem, the best thing for you to do is pray about it and God will solve the problem. But if you continue to criticize the guy, the only thing that's going to happen is things get worse. So I applauded J.K. Scott and, and the rest of those players for being bold enough to do what God told them to do, do even on that stage, because yeah. that's intimidating. You stand at the White House, you shake it in your shoes, brother. Yeah. I guarantee you. And the president walks past you, you're shaking in your shoes. And those guys, those young men, who God has always used young people, and those young men went up there bold enough to do what God told them to do, and it was awesome. I was totally inspired to do the painting. Oh, that is so cool. And you know, we got to we got to pray for our president no matter which party he's from. Right. And I know it's real easy when it's your guy to be like, yeah. yeah, I'll pray for the president and support our president. And when it's not, it's easy to complain. But you're you're right. We got to man, we got to pray. Uh it doesn't matter who's in there. Um let's talk about some of the other art. Let me see which which one which which segment cuz you you know, you cover the the you cover a wide range of pain. You're not just a niche painter. Uh, which one do you want to talk about? Well, I've got one on my easel now. Oh. And the one that just came off the easel was Bart Starr. Okay. I had a very, very good relationship with him before he passed away. And uh, I put everything I had into that painting. Uh. And I'm, I'm kind of recovering from it now. <laughs> but... Uh, uh, Bart was a special man, a Christian, and a very, very special guy. And I'm looking forward to releasing that limited edition tomorrow. And so um, the next one is the one I'm working on now. Uh, so of Ambassador Andrew Young. <laughs> we became friends when a long time ago, when he went he went to Bimini with me to unveil the Dr. King painting. He was so impressed with it, he went over there with it. And so now we're doing a painting that chronicles his life before Dr. King, with Dr. King, and after Dr. King. And it, we just want to show what a great man he is and what, what he's done all his life to serve humanity. And his life, his life has been built around that. And so we're looking forward to the unveiling on his ninth, I think it's the 90th birthday wow. and in Atlanta. Uh, Smithsonian in Washington, and then we're going to do one in Zimbabwe. In Zimbabwe? Yeah. That is cool. You know, he's an ambassador. He's been going all around the world. He's made friendships with different kings all over the world. Oh, wow. So I'm looking forward to that one. And have you been to Zimbabwe, Harare, or uh, what's the other big city there? You ever been down there? I haven't been there yet. The only place I've been outside the country is Bahamas at this point. Oh. Oh, uh, Zimbabwe is beautiful. Um, get them to take you on a on a sightseeing safari if you have time. I hear, I hear it too. Yeah, very cool. All right, I want to ask you about uh, this painting right here called "Healer of the Brokenhearted." Uh, one of my favorites. Yeah, t just tell us a little bit about that one. He went uh, before he went to the cross. He paid a price at the whipping post. He took 39 lashes for us to make sure that the healing that we need in our bodies, we could get it because the Bible says, with his stripes, we are healed. And in that painting, I wanted to show him being gruesomely scourged with the, with the whip that the soldier had. But at the same time, I wanted to show different names of the diseases in the background that will cover every time we hear it. All right. Um, I mean, we say we love Christ, and and, and we, I, th I think sometimes we need to reassess our love for him because we talk about the cross as we should. We need to, need to focus on that whipping post for a while. 
because they, the Bible said they beat him to the point to where he was unrecognizable. Mm -hmm. I think I'm showing the wrong picture there on that one. Um, which which one is the one where you show the whipping? That's uh, by his stripes. Uh, yeah, I want to show that one. There it is. Okay, so there you got the names and uh, yep. Okay, man. I, I you, you capture so much so beautifully that um, it speaks it speaks so much. Uh, look, I, as you have gone into these different areas, whether you're you're painting you know uh, Christ or you're painting you know Kenny Stabler or Bart Starr or uh, Dr. King or President Trump, have you found that the art has broken down a lot of barriers? For you, not not just in the area of race, but even across uh, faith lines. You seeing, are you seeing it at open stores? Yes, I, I think so. I think that's one reason we named the name. The name of the documentary is is so apropos. It's colors of colors of character. Mm. And Dr. King made a statement that you not judge a person by the color of their skin, mm -hmm. but by the content of their character. Mm -hmm. And there was a, a real good statement you made a while ago that it took different people of different races to help me along my journey to make sure I made it where I am. I wouldn't be sitting in this chair today without the help and the support of people who didn't look like me. And um, some of those people had to stand up to their own people and make up their minds they were gonna stick with me. And it's just like the Civil War. The Civil War would have been a failure without the, uh, the aid of all colors. You had uh, white people that were fighting for me to be free. And, and I heard from Andrew Young, the Civil Rights Movement would have failed if it wasn't for the, the opportunities from other races. But it's not a black thing. It's a civil, it's civil, it's for everybody. And so there were people who paid the ultimate price that I can be going through the doors of the University of Alabama and NASCAR. Mm, yeah, and yeah. I, I, I think we need to hear Dr. King's message now as, as loud as ever. Uh, it, it's, it's not about the color of the skin, it's the content of the character. And you know, I, I just, I hate the whole just notion, I mean, it's not scientific, it's not biblical, it's a social construct, this idea of race that you and I are somehow different just because the color of our skin, the color of our eyes. I mean, we have cultural differences, all of us do, but that's what Christ does is, is he crosses all those cultural differences. There's no black, there's no white, there's no barrier between male and female that we're one in Christ, you know? And we have to, we have to hear that in this country. And I appreciate you exemplifying it. Um, uh, it's just it's just so inspirational. Uh, if you could, well, I'm going to show people one more time the uh, website, steveskipperstudio.com, the movie, colorsofcharactermovie.com. Go check it out. Uh, support this. I mean, just you'll be inspired. And we have to hear it. And, and Steve, I appreciate so much all of your work. And I didn't even get to, to sh show all of the... Uh, all of your artwork, I, people just need to go check out the gallery. And uh, my gosh, if you haven't, you don't know what to get somebody for Christmas, um, and they like art, even if they don't like art, go get them some Steve Skipper artwork. You can get these prints, you can have them shipped out pretty quickly. But Steve, just b bottom line, as you look back at what God has done in your life and the obstacles you've overcome, uh, the doors that have been open to you, the, the opportunities that you've had. Uh, what do you think is just the one thing that people just have to take with them when they look at your life and they think of Steve Skipper, what truth do you hope that they, they carry with them and get down into their souls? I pray that uh, people, will, when the movie goes off, when it's over, I pray that people pick up the spiritual shovels 
that start to dig up that gift that God gave them. That they replace that gift with a career or a job or some skill or something like that. They replaced it because they didn't know how powerful it was. They didn't know that God gave them something that would touch this world and turn it around. Every baby that comes here has got that gift. That's why the enemy is trying his best to destroy them through abortion or whatever else. He knows that they're gifted with purpose and that purpose will turn him upside down. So when it comes to looking at the movie, I hope they realize that God is no respecter of person. This is not really about me. This is something that God gave me to tell you that you need to pick up that gift. I don't care if you gotta dig it up or whatever and find out what it is. And most people already know, but they don't believe that God could bless them in a way where they could use this not only to make a living, but to make a difference. And it's never too late. That is so true, man. Thank you. Thank you so much. I just, I love your brother. I appreciate, I appreciate you. you, man. I love you too. Oh, this is just so good. You got to share this. If you haven't hit share on this interview already, you're a little slow to, you're just probably too wrapped up in it. I get it. Uh, share this, my goodness, and subscribe if you haven't already. Um, and join us again. Check out the gallery. Uh, just support what this man does and, and the, the documentary, all that. So good. So good. Thank you again, Steve. Thank you guys for watching. We'll see you again next time here on Life Today Live. what you said on paper.